My name is August Reinisch. I'm a professor of international law at the University of Vienna. I have been asked to talk about the enforcement of exit awards in particular and of investment awards uh, more in general. Now, why do I emphasize that? Uh, there is a very special regime that deals with the enforcement of exit awards uh, as opposed to non-exit awards. And by non-exit awards, we mean awards rendered pursuant to the ANCITRAL rules, to LCIA, uh, to Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, or also according to the exit additional facility. Uh, maybe it would be useful to start out with the regular enforcement rules. Regular, I mean not the special ones dealing with exit awards. Those are governed by the New York Convention. So investment awards are basically treated like commercial arbitration awards, foreign arbitral awards, and if qualifying under the New York Convention, they will be subject to the core provision under its Article 3, that is, that the contracting parties recognize and enforce such awards. There have been certain problems of a technical nature, whether investment awards are commercial awards. In order to avoid that, some of the investment agreements specifically provide that, that investment disputes are commercial disputes for the purposes of the New York Convention. There have been some technical disputes about the agreement in writing, which is uh, required under the New York Convention. Again, this is something that investment agreements uh, have explicitly laid down, saying that also the uh, offer of consent contained in a treaty and the acceptance of such offer constitute an agreement in writing for the purposes of the New York Convention. Now, although the New York Convention provides for a very effective mechanism of enforcing awards, it also provides for a number of exceptions uh, to that. On the one hand, there is a whole number of reasons that would allow uh, not only the challenging of an award, if something in the procedure was wrong, but also the non-recognition and non-enforcement of such awards, and that of course applies also to investment awards. But more importantly, uh, there are uh, two additional grounds uh, which permit domestic courts to refuse the enforcement of investment awards under the New York Convention, and that is that the topic may be non-arbitrable and, in practice more important, that uh, the award and its enforcement would be contrary to the public policy of the country where the enforcement is requested. The non-arbitrability in practice hasn't ra raised that many problems, although it's conceivable to argue that questions of public law, of expropriation, of fair and equitable treatment, um, are not the usual commercial disputes um, that are brought under the New York Convention. There are only few, very few cases uh, in this context. Uh, with regard to the public policy, uh, also some of the NAFTA and additional facility cases have been challenged, but by and large, uh, domestic courts have uh, followed uh, the um, rather enforcement-friendly tendency of the New York Convention. Now, what the New York Convention, of course, does not explicitly regulate, but which is generally accepted, still a major hurdle to the enforcement of awards rendered against states or state entities, are the rules on state immunity with regard to enforcement. These rules are largely customary international law uh, and uh, sometimes governed by regional
original treaties and there is a current attempt uh, at codification in 2004 the United Nations uh, opened uh, for signature a convention on the jurisdictional immunities of states and their property but that convention has not yet entered into force I will come back to the state immunity issues when we address exit awards but it is important to see that with regard to all kinds of investment awards, state immunity may be an important hurdle. Now, if I move to the ICSID Convention, it's very important to point out that as opposed uh, to those awards which are subject to the uh, New York Convention, the ICSID Convention itself has a separate enforcement regime in its Articles 53 to 55, pursuant to which uh, awards rendered uh, under the Convention have to be honored and enforced in a specific way. Now, what is the difference here? Article 53 of the Convention provides that the award shall be binding on the parties and each party shall abide by and comply with the terms of the award except if there is a stay of enforcement uh, in annulment proceedings. But in addition to the finality uh, and res judicata effect of an award, this adds a public international law, a conventional obligation to abide by and comply with the terms of the award. Now, one may question what that in practice adds to the obligation, but of course there are important additional consequences. If a state does not observe exit awards, uh, it may uh, lead to the exercise of diplomatic protection by the home country of the investor. It may even lead to a dispute being brought to the International Court of Justice according to Article 64 of the Exit Convention, uh, which to now my knowledge has not occurred so far, uh, but it provides another potential uh, way uh, to ensure observance. Now, beyond uh, those provisions dealing with the observance, in particular Article 50 of the Convention is relevant. Article 54 of the Convention provides that not only the states uh, that are bound by a specific award have to abide by it. In addition, it says each contracting state shall recognize an award rendered pursuant to this Convention as binding and enforce the pecuniary obligations imposed by that award within its territories as if it were a final judgment of a court in that state. Now, what this clearly adds is a treaty obligation for all exit contracting parties uh, to enforce awards, even awards rendered against other parties of the Convention. And it also makes clear that there is no public policy scrutiny, there is no scrutiny that we are familiar with from the New York Convention. Rather, it is the award as such which must be enforced like a final judgment of a domestic court. Now, as uh, with all legal provisions, there is an exception, and the exception is found in Article 55. Article 55 of the Convention says that nothing in Article 54, the broad enforcement obligation we have just discussed, shall be construed as derogating from the law in force in any contracting state relating to immunity of that state or of any foreign state from execution. Now, what that provision means is that although there is an obligation to enforce exit awards for all contracting parties, that does not change the fact 
that there are certain rules relating to state immunity from execution or enforcement measures which are not touched upon, which remain in force, which are not derogated from. And here we are back to the issues of what actually are those rules of state immunity from execution. What kind of state assets, state property are immune from enforcement measures? And here uh, we had in the past, in a couple of situations, uh, problems of investors to actually enforce their awards. The problem starts with identifying in which jurisdictions such assets may be located. And at the second, at the legal level, once such assets may have been identified to ascertain whether they are subject or are exempt from enforcement measures. It is very difficult uh, to give a precise answer. Uh, the 2004 convention uh, lists a number of property items that typically are considered uh, to be exempt uh, from such enforcement measures. But by and large, a, albeit very simplified, uh, rule of thumb would be that assets in governmental use or used for governmental purposes are exempt from enforcement measures, enjoy such immunity. Thus, it will be only assets that do not serve such governmental purposes or serve positively formulated commercial purposes that may be effectively used for 